Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Hello. Thanks for making it here, the last, last lecture of the day. All right. Um, I'm happy to pre uh, present to you today on this topic of how video games could go beyond our dreams about them uh, in almost every dimension and become really a, a tool to improve our lives in a very deep way. And so I'm going to present to you on this topic now. And first, I want to just start with the goals. And what are the goals of this type of mission, right? So my goals are really pretty straightforward, to see if we can take this technology into the domain of improving quality of life. And not everyone in the medical domain uh, is focused on this, right? So there's a lot of technology and innovation right now in trying to allow us to live longer. Um, but my goal is really to see if we can come up with innovative approaches to actually living better. And so the mission is, and the vision, is to see if we can develop effective approaches to enhance cognition in both those of us that are healthy and those of us that are suffering from different diseases and conditions and illnesses. And this is really um, a very broad goal. For the healthy, it represents the main mission of our education system, correct? It's not just to transfer content, but actually improving how our brains process information. And from the point of view of the impaired, it's really the goal of the mental health care system, to see if we can develop an approach to help those that are suffering from neurological and psychiatric disease. So I want to take a step back before we look into the future and talk about the current, or yesterday in a lot of ways, and say, where do we stand right now? And what I'm going to propose to you is that both our education and our medical system have a lot of deficiencies uh, that might be corrected by this innovative uh, sort of dream that we have in my laboratory. So let's start with a, a common occurrence, a 60-year-old that presents to their physician with complaints about their cognitive abilities, their attention, their memory, their thinking. Um, and this happens all the time. Um, it might be against this person's will. Perhaps their significant other has been seeing changes in how they interact with their family or their workplace. And they might go down to see their doctor and say, I'm worried about what's happening or my significant other's worried. If that happens right now, even in the best medical centers in the world, what we find is that you start out with a very poor characterization. And what this means is that unless you wind up at a neurologist or a psychiatrist, but even there, you're going to have a very um, undetailed view of what's going on. And so you might have a, a cognitive assessment, but even there, it might not focus in on exactly what's changing in your brain to lead to these deficits. And what you will almost not have assuredly is a functional brain image to understand how your brain is uniquely being challenged and what's going on. So that's the first thing. But if it's concerning enough to the doctor, then what will happen is that you will get treated. And this is how you'll likely be treated, right? You'll be treated, oh, I'm out of range there. You'll be treated with one of these. So medications through drugs and pharmaceuticals is the mainstay of our treatment. Um, but these are very poorly targeted. So they might be generally targeted to a neurotransmitter system, but what drugs that we have right now, none of them do, is actually activate the circuits of the brain. So we don't really have a selective way to target their effects, and because of that, we have to increase their doses to very high levels, and then we wind up with side effects. Most of what doctors do, psychiatrists and neurologists, once they start a treatment plan, is managing the side effects that are caused by the very drugs that they're using to have a positive effect. So that's another problem with the system. Another one is that it's entirely non-personalized. So the prescription plan that this person or yourself is receiving is based on population data. And we know there's a large amount of heterogeneity in those populations that went into the study design. So it's possible that the prescriptive advice that's being given to this person is not exactly what works for them. And that's a deficit of, of most of the treatments that we have right now. The other thing is that it's unimodal. And by this, I mean that it's likely to be a treatment that consists of just this single intervention, right? So you get a pill, but you don't usually get it with other types of uh, co-support systems. For example, we know that there's a tremendous wealth of data that reveals that physical exercise can have a positive impact on brain health. And yet you don't see prescribed too frequently a medication plus physical exercise for something like cognitive impairment. And the last is that it's an open loop system. And what I mean by that is that the time between when we give an intervention and we monitor what the effect was and then we revise and reapply is very long. 
So the most effective way to lead to change, and all engineers know this, is through a closed loop system. You apply, you record, then you adjust and reapply with as short a latency as possible. And so you create this closed feedback loop, and that's how you drive change. And we don't see that, right? When you give a medication, someone takes it, they go home, maybe they come back in a month later, and they have a subjective impression about what their side effects were and what their effects were. And based on that information, the physician makes a really non-empirically based decision about going up or down on the dose. So we have this very open loop system. And I maintain that this is just really not good enough. Right? For 2014 to be, for this to be the main approach that we have across the vast array of psychiatric and neurological diseases, we could be doing a lot better. And so one of the goals of my lab is to create a new system, one that is targeted, personalized, multimodal, and closed loop. And we're certainly not there yet, but this is our goal, because this is how we know that we can have a large change in a system like the brain to help improve its function. The first step, I'm going to give you three steps that we're taking. The first step, and the one that we've been working on for the longest, is to understand the target. So if we don't know what the target is, then we can't really direct our treatments, and we're unlikely to have a really meaningful and sustainable effect. To do this, my lab uses an array of tools, functional MRI, electroencephalography, transcranial electrical stimulation. And we use this in a very multimodal fashion to understand how the brain works, to understand what its vulnerabilities are, what are the neural markers of how it works, so that we have objective indicators of how we might change the brain. So we've been involved in this for quite a bit, and now we understand where the sensitivities are in our brain and where they are in different populations, like older adults, which we tend to work with quite frequently. The next step is to build the engine, an engine of change, right? That's what we're all doing here in some way. How do you do that? Well, you need fuel for that engine. So the first step is what fuels the engine. And what fuels the engine is this, brain plasticity. So we now know that our brain has an ability to modify its function, its structure, its chemistry, at every level in response to targeted interventions with the environment around it and new experiences. So because brain plasticity exists, and that it's present throughout our lives, it allows the type of research that we do to be possible. So if this didn't exist, I wouldn't be talking to you today. So really, what we're really doing is just harnessing this natural phenomenon of our brain to change in response to inter interactions with the environment. Let's take a look at what the landscape is of engines of change. So we should consider all of them when we're picking uh, which one to use as a tool. So, there are targeted interactions with the environment that we've been using for quite a long time, such as education, meditation, training, enriched environments. Then there are pharmaceuticals themselves. So even though these are rather blunt instruments, as I described, we know they activate trans neurotransmitter systems, and they can act to prove cognition. So these were all designed for therapeutic goals, like modafinil for narcolepsy, Adderall and Ritalin for ADHD, and Aricept for Alzheimer's disease, but many of these are also used generally for cognition. As you might be aware, Adderall is used on college campuses around the world to uh, at least attempt to boost cognitive abilities. And so we should keep that on the landscape of things to consider. We know that things that are good for our body are good for our brains. Physical exercise has a wealth of data on brain health, as does nutrition. There are other approaches that have less data but are intriguing. For example, neurofeedback which is being able to see or even hear your own neural activity and learn how to control it, control it with feedback loops. And then there are other approaches like neuromodulation. So you could stimulate the brain either electrically or magnetically, either at the scalp or with implantable electrodes, and use that to control brain activity. We now know that you could stimulate the brain with a very low electrical field and change plasticity in the cortex that underlies that. So this is another tool that we can use as an enhancer. And then we have video games, which brings uh, probably most of you here today to hear about. And this is what we've been using in our lab over the last five years as a tool, as basically the engine of change. And I'd just like to put up this one slide because I think that everyone here is convinced that this is true, that video games can have a positive impact. But in the 1980s, there was definitely a lot of question, and maybe some of that persists. So here's a quote from Time Magazine that video games are just another manifestation of human mania, our endearing quality of going relentlessly after absolutely pointless goals. <laughs> so I don't believe this. I assume that most of you sitting here today don't believe this. But 
especially when you come about this through the medical world where I live, um, you know, there are still some people that don't quite understand uh, this concept of video games as this real tools of change. Um, my inspiration for bringing video games into my world was really based on a literature that shows that first-person shooters, consumer video games, can improve cognitive abilities in young adults and children that play them. And you see that whether you look for effects in those that spend a lot of time on gameplay and those that don't play these games at all, if you just compare their cognitive abilities in the laboratory. And you could see it if you bring in naive subjects, people that have no video game experience and have them play these games and compare it to other games that don't involve such interactions that are complicated like in first person shooters. And you see that you can have an effect on certain types of cognitive abilities, what we call cognitive control abilities, um, that uh, are pretty uh, pronounced and lasting. And this has been documented in many studies. So we asked the question around five years ago now, can we develop a custom designed video game to enhance cognitive control abilities in older adults? So can we take a lot of the sort of mechanics of those video games, the first person shooters, bring them into a more controlled setting and target them to see if we can lead to improvements in how older brains process information. That was our goal. And to do that, I teamed up with friends of mine who at the time were working for the company LucasArts, um, which unfortunately doesn't exist any longer. But uh, they um, were very high level video game professionals, programmers, artists, designers. And I came up with this idea for a game to challenge the brains of older adults and asked if they would be able to come down to my lab and work with my team, help us build a game, and then go through a careful, well-controlled study and see what its impact was. Um, and I was delighted to find that um, they were really excited about it. And they, their perspective was they've been teaching teenagers how to kill aliens for 15 years now, most of their professional life. And they were looking forward to the opportunity to work on games that might have a different type of impact. And so uh, we coalesced as a team and spent a year in development. This is an earlier version of a game called NeuroRacer. And um, I'll show you the game, and then I'll tell you some of the special elements that we think makes it uh, work. And I'll, then I'll tell you about the data a little bit. So how NeuroRacer works is that you're driving this car on a road, moving it left, right, up, down, pushing forward when the hill goes up. It's actually quite hard to keep your car on the road. And while that's going on, you're also responding as accurately and as rapidly to target signs like green circles, which you just saw, and not to green pentagons or red circles. And so you have these two tasks that are both quite challenging. They both take some time to get good at. But while you're playing them, they're both adaptive, meaning that as you get better, they get harder. And so their, their challenge scales to your skill level. So it holds you right in that sweet spot, which as our game des designers like to think of as a flow state. And I know that's term, that term is used in this field a lot. To us, we think it's the state where you can maximize harnessing plasticity, where you're just pushing the system hard enough that it could change, but not pushing it too hard that people give up. So we all have the same goals, to get people to that state. And we use these staircase algorithms that we borrowed from the field of psychophysics, which essentially adjusts in real time the challenge to performance levels. Then we cycle in different rewards and, uh, and feedback in order to keep people engaged and also to get to the endpoints that we want. So for example, in this particular game, we want both skills to enhance. And therefore, you only get the big rewards when both of the two two skills on the tasks increase. So you have to get them both up, you can't trade off. And then what we do is we do a whole series of brain recordings before and after gameplay. I'm gonna show you some of the data from the paper that we published last year on this. So this was a four year study, three different experiments. And the first thing we said is can we use a video game just as a behavioral diagnostic of performance? And so what you're looking at here is multitasking performance across the ages of eight to 80 years old on the game itself. And how that's defined is your performance when you do that sign test that I described to you alone versus what happens when you also drive at the same time. So 0% at the top would mean that you're unimpaired by adding on a secondary task. You're just as well as the sign task alone as well as when you're also driving. And most 20-year-olds, uh, which was the first group that we studied, were convinced that they would be perfect at this, that they are the optimal multitaskers because they practice it every day, and so that they would have a 0%. Um, and that's not what we find. We find that they have a 27% drop in performance when you do these two tasks concurrently. 
We already know that 70-year-olds would be impaired on this because we've been publishing for many years that this type of activity in general is something that older adults have challenged, are challenged by. But we ask, what happens in between? What happens as you move across the lifespan? Do you just hold this ability until 69 years of age and then just decline in one tragic year? And that's not what occurs. Every year is sort of equally uh, tragic along the way. We see that <laughs> the, the biggest drop is actually between 20 years old and 30 year olds. But you get this very linear decline from 27% to 63% drop in performance due to multitasking, what we call the cost of multitasking. Well, it's not part of this paper, but some recent work, we asked what happens when eight to 12 year olds play this game to try to get even a bigger perspective on what this looks like. And this is what you see for eight to 12 year olds. So it's a skill that develops and then declines as you move across life. So is anyone in here 23 years old? Oh, there's a lot of 23 year olds. So this is it. You should be very uh, excited about every day of this year. Because you're sort of right there at the peak of the cognitive pyramid. So you might not feel so good in five years from now. So this is, uh, this is something that we see for lots of different type of cognitive abilities um, that we call fluid, that involve processing speed or prefrontal cortex cognitive control, that they peak and then they, they, then they tend to decline. And then we ask, can we use the video game not just as a behavioral diagnostic, but as a neural diagnostic? So one challenge that we have in game development is to build games that we can also use while we record neural activity both while people play them inside MRI scanners with special joysticks that allow that to occur, as well as with high density EEG recordings. And so what we ask is, how does this activity from the front part of the brain, known as midline frontal theta, how does it change uh, what happens in the brain right at the most challenging part of the game, which is you're driving the car, trying to keep it on the road, then a sign comes up. You have to figure out, is that my sign? And you have to press it as fast as possible. Well, if you're 20 years old, this is what happens. You get this burst. So yellow, you could see the scale over here. Yellow is around 3 quarters of the way up. The nose is, this is looking down on a head. So the nose is up here. The ears are to the side. You get this burst of activity from the front part of the brain. This occurs within a third of a second after a sign comes up. It just blasts, and then it declines. This low frequency activity, which is the front part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, being engaged by this challenge of these two tasks colliding with each other. If you're 70, you get a burst, but you could see it really doesn't get out of the green level. right? So it's, it's, it's not as robust, and it occurs later. So now we could show, using a video game, along with uh, uh, neural recordings at the same time, we could get both a behavioral and a neural diagnostic of how someone's performing and where they fit in uh, according to the age. The next thing we want to do is have our participants go home and play the game either the training game or control game. So we have three different control groups in this study. And then we can look at them one month later when they come back to the lab and ask what happens to the multitasking performance on the game and what happens to their brain. So I'm going to just give you a quick snapshot of what that is. So that's what a 60 to 70 year old looks like when they play for a month when they come back. Their performance on the game actually exceeds that of 20 year olds who play it in a single visit. And you could see how different their brains are reaching this level of the highest power, the red power. It is faster and it is stronger than many of the 20 year olds, even after a month of training. When we bring them back six months, six months later and have them play the game, we see that this multitask ability is actually preserved and doesn't even decline, even though they haven't played the game over those last six months. Another thing we find is that other skills also improves. So their working memory for faces, which is very different than the task that they trained on, improves, as well as a vigilance task, which is holding their attention to this very boring repetition of stimuli looking for a rare target. So these skills were not trained directly by the game, but because there's an underlying, what we think of as a neural bridge between the prefrontal cortex and what we put pressure on in the game and these other skills, we see this, which is known as a transfer of benefits, so that you get benefits outside of the game itself. And we were really delighted after five years of effort that this landed on the cover of Nature Magazine, which to us is like Rolling Stones would be to a, a recording artist. Um, and uh, it was really validating after five years of effort uh, as a combination between a game team and a lab to reach this level. Um, you could see there's this really exciting but intimidating title that Nature put on of Game Changer. 
and uh, it led me to spend months explaining to the media that I don't think this particular game is that game changer. Um, I think that it's the concept that you can build a customized game that targets a neural process in a specific population and then validate it in carefully controlled studies along with mechanisms that hopefully that process is what will lead to change. That you think about games and design them and validate them carefully like you would any other intervention. And hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of that. The next step is to move it to the real world. So for this game, uh, it is now leaving, it has left the lab. Over the years that we've been doing this research, I filed a patent at UCSF. So UCSF owns a patent, my university, behind the methodology of this game. And then I helped co-found a company that's partly based in Boston and part in San Francisco. Those folks that work for LucasArts now work full time for this company. So it's a really nice circle of how working with my friends as sort of a uh, volunteer basis became a job for them in the future. And I just want to give you a quick look at this game and, and really to make the point of what happens when a game that has you know, baked in the lab for, for five years and went through research could then become something that hopefully can have more uh, widespread impact. Hope I, I can talk over this. Perfect. So what you'll see is that all the same mechanics are preserved. There's two tasks going on, the driving task and the sign task, but now it's in a much richer environment, much higher rewarding. It uses uh, an iPad so that it's mobile and accessible. It uses the accelerometer, way more intuitive than when we used the joystick. Um, same goal, both two tasks, both have to go up in order for you to get the rewards. Um, we bring on a higher level of art, music, and story than we ever have before. And we think this is really necessary for engagement and immersion, especially if you don't have violence in your game, which we have managed to, to keep out. Um, when we test this on 8 to 12 year olds, all they want to do is customize their avatar. They have, they have no other comments at all, so we, we give them that, that ability. It helps put them in the game. Um, so the game challenges not just in difficulty every second, but goes through different levels that challenges you cognitively in unique ways. Um, that game is now going through testing for ADHD, depression, dementia, and autism. So this is not directed as a consumer game, at least not now. And um, the really challenging pathway that this company has chosen to take is to see if this can go through the FDA uh, approval pathway and potentially becomes the world's uh, first prescribable video game. So that's what's going on, thank you. So the, you know, the, future, it, the future's open and we'll have to see. It depends on the success of these studies. Um, so one other interesting point is that two of the initial investors uh, to the company's research efforts are this company here, which is Shire Pharmaceuticals, which makes Adderall, that's the main treatment for ADHD, and this company over here, Pfizer, makes Aricep, which is the main treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So it's a really interesting changing of the tide story to see big pharma investing in what's essentially a, a video game company, one that's directed at therapeutics. So um, I think it'll be exciting to see what happens over, over the years. In my lab, we're back in the game development phase, so it's sort of like my child has gone off to college and the best thing I could do is to let it go, let other people validate it, and then I had that you know, sort of empty nest feeling. Um, so now our lab is like, well, we can get back to the business of building new games. And so we have lots of games that are acting on different aspects of cognition. Um, this one's interesting. It uh, takes the principles of concentrative meditation and integrates them with the game dynamics of adaptivity and feedback, I think, in some really powerful ways. So this is actually an NIH-funded study. So five years ago, when I first came up with this idea, the NIH didn't seem very interested in funding us, but times have changed, and video games have really moved into a, a new generation. Um, we're also bringing in new technology that we think is really exciting and could have a lot of impact in our world. So example, a full body motion capture, a study that we're doing called Brain Body Trainer, uses the Kinect to challenge you both physically and cognitively in a very integrated way. We are doing work with virtual reality. So this uh, fellow over here is Mickey Hart, who's the drummer from The Grateful Dead, who's working on a, a video game built around rhythm 
with our laboratory that you could see has an Oculus Rift on and also a 64 channel mobile EEG headset so that we can but have both brain recordings and a virtual reality uh, game at the same time. And these are some new studies in our lab. I just want to conclude by telling you what we're doing next, right? So video games are a really powerful way of changing the brain as we feel because what they do is they activate circuits. Right? That's what, we don't have drugs that do that. We don't have that level of selectivity. And that's how games act, right? Because you interact with the environment in a targeted way, your brain acts selectively. But we think that we could push it even further and think of the video games, like we said, as the engine, but then you can actually apply other modalities to boost the effects. So I want to show you about some work that we're doing now to bring neuromodulation and neurofeedback into the same type of intervention with the video game. What we have to do in order to do that is to have real-time data. So we have real-time performance data that feeds into the game, how fast you are. What we're doing now over the last year, we've been working with multiple groups, especially the Swartz Center at University of California, San Diego, and developing real-time brain imaging. What you're looking at here is a combination of MRI and EEG. So the structure of the brain, as well as these golden fibers, are the connectivity in the brain. And these lights, the flashes, are EEG activity, showing you different frequencies that have been mapped onto the sources in the brain using algorithms. Then we could bring this information into the Unity game engine, allowing us to navigate through this using a joystick. So you can actually fly through a brain. This brain is showing you both the structure, as I said, as well as the real-time activity of someone's brain. And so um, a lot of this technology is still in development. We've been working with NVIDIA, the GPU company, to speed up this processing and get as close as we can to real-time activity. So it's really exciting. It's a beautiful view of the brain. Um, but what we're most excited about right now and what we're using first is the fact that this activity is being generated in real time. And so the first point I want to make is that we already use a closed loop in our video game projects, right? So your brain, you make a decision. Something happens in your brain. It guides your behavior, which impacts the game. The game knows that in real time, changes its challenge, and then feeds back a different environment. And so this real-time feedback closed loop is what goes on already in all of our game studies. Using that real-time EEG data that I just showed you, we could then feed that data into the game. Right? So essentially what would be happening is that the game would learn the strengths and the weaknesses in how your brain processes information and then guide the feedback and the adaptivity to put pressure on those processes. So if you have a weakness, let's say, in some aspect of perceptual processing or sensory motor transformation, and we have a neural signature of it, we can have the game then feedback and then change that and push on that process very selectively. The other thing that we're doing is we could take real-time EEG data and use that to guide stimulators. As I already described to you, stimulating the brain can increase its plasticity. So let's say, and we could feed that back into the brain. So let's say you have a, a damage of an injury from a traumatic brain uh, injury or uh, a stroke. We can apply a current to increase plasticity in that area during gameplay. And we actually have data in our lab showing that that seems to be the case that we can do that. So I just want to summarize with this view right here. So this is 2014. You're the gentleman that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. You go to your doctor. You get one of these. And what that does is this, right? It activates your entire brain in a very blunt way, non-selective. What we hope is literally in five years that we could drop those doses down, in some cases potentially remove them, and then use a game to selectively activate a circuit in your brain. Then we could take EEG data to a, different, to a particular process, feed that into the game, and then back into the brain to potentiate that circuit. And we could also take other signals from the game, feed that into a cap, like this cap here that's a stimulator, and use that to stimulate different uh, frequencies in the brain. And so what we're looking at here is a targeted, personalized, multimodal, and closed-loop design. Right? We're not there yet. It's a plan. We know that the, brain, that the games are quite effective. And right now, we have research projects on both sides of this to see if we could have neural closed loop so that we could have more selective treatments, sort of like a surgeon to be able to sculpt and shape these, these circuits of the brain to make them more effective. Over the next 10 years, 
we are going to expand this out. So we're building the basic concepts, but then we're collaborating with physician scientists that work on a whole host of different diseases. So this is not a theoretical list. These are actually uh, collaborations that have already begun in our lab with other groups at UCSF and outside of UCSF. And then there is maybe the most challenging but interesting in some ways because it'll pack the, the largest population is to think about some of these approaches as educational tools. And so what our lab has done, we've just created a new lab at UCSF called the Neuroscape Lab, which was designed to bridge technology and neuroscience. I realized over the years that we didn't actually have a laboratory to do the types of experiments that we were coming up with. Virtual reality, full body motion capture. Another goal of the lab is to use consumer devices wherever, wherever possible so that we have the best chance of moving this technology out of the lab. So we have scalability and accessibility. And so this lab was just completed um, a couple months ago. And right now, we're working with video game programmers and designers and artists like we did years ago to build the new technology. This is our control room. This is the uh, actual laboratory, which is on the other side of the room. You could do VR experiments over here. This is our mobile lab set up for full body gaming. And so we're excited to see what we'll be able to do with a new laboratory and a host of new collaborators around the Bay Area that want to help us build video games and see if we can validate these as the medical tools of the future. And thank you for your attention. I don't believe we had time for questions, but I'm certainly happy to take them. Is anyone else here? Okay, let's just take a question. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know why you chose to go to the FDA and uh, approval route and take it as prescription. Okay, I'll repeat the question. The question was, why go through the FDA route and try to get it prescribable? The main reason for that is um, physicians are very disinclined to prescribe things that don't go through that pathway. It's just, it's just the reality. Um, it doesn't mean it's the only way, but one of the things that we're interested in is sort of penetrating the current system directly, playing by the same rules that exist now, and then helping to change those rules, which certainly need to change. So it's, it's one possibility. We'll see what happens over time. The FDA is um, surprisingly and interestingly open to this idea. Um, so there's a lot of work ahead of us um, from the company perspective to see if that'll happen. But that's the idea, to try to actually move this type of therapy into the mainstay of medicine, and so that it's not sitting as an alternative, which I don't think it does it full justice. I was just wondering, you said you said you're still making double dependency um, medication over a longer timeline. Could you talk about uh, a month of the EEG pulse and your old type of one? What does it say as far as, say, the EEG? Yeah, so uh, the question is about sustainability of the impact of these type of game interventions. So we looked after six months and showed that at least on the skills that were improved on the game, they didn't diminish, which we were actually shocked about. If we knew that that's what it was going to look like, we would have done everything at six months. Um, but we didn't really think that, thing, that it would last so robustly. Um, those type of experiments of sustainability are really important. Um, and our field gets a lot of attention for not showing that frequently. I think that both makes sense and also is a little flawed. I mean, you wouldn't think that you could go to the gym for a month and then have benefits a year later, and I think we all appreciate that. Um, what, what is more likely to happen, I think, and where sustainability will occur, is if engaging in this type of game or you know, even physical fitness leads you to then change your lifestyle so that you interact with your environment in a different way. So maybe the benefits of going to the gym doesn't last a year, but now you take the stairs instead of the elevator because you feel healthier. So I think it's the same thing and some of the sustainability that you see with games is not necessarily that the brain is rewired never to change again, but now that your brain has gotten a boost or pushed into a different state, you now interact with the environment differently and keep challenging it and that maintains it. At least that's what I think. But there's very little research on that and we're planning on doing more. All right, I'll take another question until they kick us out, I guess. lead to transfer. 
Yeah, so this concept of transfer is like, if, if, if sustainability is a challenge, transfer is even the bigger one and the most critical one. And uh, transfer is very important, right? You don't want people to just get better at what they're practicing on. Um, and how you get transfer uh, is challenging, and few people do, and it was a big benefit of that study that we found it. I have mixed feelings about the whole concept of transfer. Sometimes it's presented as if it's like a magic trick, that you put something under this cup and then somehow pull it off and it's under this cup. And that's not what occurs, right? So what has to happen is that if it gets from here to here, it means that they're actually attached to each other. And that's why I use that concept of a neural bridge. So to get transfer, you have to understand the mechanisms of whatever system you're working on and then what other systems might have in common with it. It doesn't have to be the same, but it has to have an overlap and then you'll get benefit. Same with physical fitness. I mean, cardio, cardio training doesn't necessarily lead to improvements in other sports or other things that you might need different skills for. So there has to be an overlap. So the first rule of trying to get transfer is to select what you're trying to change, and then the things that might reasonably show an improvement based on that. Um, so the, the, the selection of outcome measures are very important in any study where transfer is, is the goal, and that's often the case. Um, other than that, I think breadth of training is something that would have a good chance of hitting multiple different targets. But it's, we're still at the infancy in understanding how to develop games to have these really meaningful and sustainable changes. Uh, but those are at least some of the general principles. And then I think good game design is a, is a really critical feature. Um, I think that scientists are frequently neglect that aspect. And um, you know, in, in our world, in my lab and the companies that I work with, we take game design as serious as the science. I mean, we put equal precedence on them. And uh, it's a back and forth relationship to build something that's fun, immersive, engaging, that people sustain. In, sustain their play and also uh, get deeply involved, which we think is necessary to get changes in the brain, and then also keep scientific principles so that the game is targeted. To do both of those is a really, really hard job, um, but that's what I think we need to do to have games reach, reach this level. Um, okay, I'll take one more. Yeah, it's a great, great question. I'm glad you asked that one. So, um, you know, there's my, my general view is nothing comes without consequences. So the question is dependency. And really the question more broadly is about side effects, I would say. Dependency and addiction, or however you want to think about that aspect of video games, is an example of a side effect, I would say. So studies that are performed should be looking for negative consequences just as as, as carefully as they're looking for positive benefits. And that's a, a sort of a responsible approach to this type of research. So there could be many benefits, but there could be disadvantages, right? So you don't want to create a system where your, um, your population is required to always keep engaging with the game or that they want to engage with the game and not do anything else. I think that balance is very important and understanding that in the study design is really critical. Um, and then thinking about how to manage it. Um, for example, in the studies that we design right now for our ADHD trial, the game plays 20 minutes, and then you can't play it, and it doesn't reactivate until the next day at the same time. So you get really, uh, we use the software to create a structure of training. And for a study, it's very important because we want to have the same dosing across all of our participants. But you can imagine if it's a therapeutic someday that you might control gameplay, you know, just because you give someone seven pills a week doesn't mean that they take them all on Monday, right? It's the same concept that you could help space out the treatment in that way. So I think that it is, it is important. I think that some people are more dis predisposed to that aspect of games, but it's something that we should take seriously as we think about this as a therapeutic tool. All right, thank you.